Welcome to another episode of Inside U Miami Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Henri Ford, the Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine. Today, I am thrilled to welcome to the studio Dr. Michael Benatar, Professor of Neurology and the Walter Bradley Chair in ALS Research. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is what ALS stands for. He's also the Chief of, Neuromus of the Neuromuscular Division, the Executive Director of the ALS Center, and the Vice Chair for Clinical and Translational Research in the Department of Neurology. Dr. Benatar is one of the foremost experts in ALS internationally. His, pioneer his pioneering research has led to a paradigm shift in our approach to understanding the disease by focusing primarily on pre-symptomatic ALS. Dr. Benatar, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. I am so excited about the conversation we're about to have because ALS is such an important problem and, and one that seems to be growing. But before we get into the substance of our discussion, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got to be where you are today, the professor of neurology and the chief of uh, the Division of uh, Movement Disorders. Well, thanks so, for having me. No muscular. Thanks for having me. Um, as you can perhaps tell from my, um, from my accent, I'm, I'm not a local South Floridian. Um, I grew up in Cape Town, South Africa, which is where I went to medical school um, and got a fantastic clinical training, but really knew very little about science. Um, so I was very fortunate to get a Rhodes Scholarship and went off to Oxford to do a PhD where I worked in the laboratory of the late John Newsom Davis who is actually a myasthenia gravis expert, which is a topic for a discussion another time. Um, but did my PhD there and then went back to South Africa to do my clinical training in neurology, but really realized that if I wanted to combine a career in looking after people, being a clinical neurologist and doing science, doing research, um, that there weren't opportunities in South Africa. And so that's what led me to the US and I repeated a residency in, in neurology at, in Boston um, at the Beth Israel Deaconess did a fellowship in neuromuscular disease. Um, and then I've been moving south ever since. Um, as a native South African, Boston was Chile. So I was I spent eight years at Emory. Um, then about 12, 13 years ago, um, was recruited down here um, as the first incumbent of the Walter Bradley chair, which is a great honor knowing Wally and um, his legacy in the department and his own um, work in the field of ALS. And what really brought me down here was the opportunity to combine both the clinical care of people with this disease, but also embedding within that clinical care paradigm um, the opportunity to advance research and do research that's motivated by things that matter to patients and to have that research succeed by patients being involved in that research. And so that was the opportunity and what we spent the last um, 12, 13 years building. Well, that's fantastic. So, so to recap, medical school in Cape Town, then Rhodes Scholarship, five years getting your PhD uh, in neuroscience, neuroscience. At, at Oxford. And then you come back and start all over, except for the medical school part. You do a residency again. And so that, that's expert. Is it resilience, perseverance, or just uh, totally being crazy? Well, it's interesting. It's, it's unfortunately the nature of the U.S. system, right, mm -hmm. that um, the U.S. doesn't accept a lot of training from elsewhere. Um, and so I won't deny that doing a second internship and residency was a royal pain. Um, but it's interesting because when one comes into a training program, having already trained, you get to learn different things and you get to focus your attention on different things. Exactly. I mean, you bring a perspective maybe that your fellow trainees don't have. Um, and so it was an opportunity to learn about the American healthcare system and to uh, r really be able to sort of move my thinking about science forward perhaps earlier than I might otherwise have been able to do in a clinical training. So clearly you were at a distinct, you had a distinct advantage over the others who were going through the first I time. think that's right because it's yeah. the second time around. More mature. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, let's talk a little bit about the others. We, we tell, our, our, tell our audience um, what exactly the disease is, who is at risk, um, uh, you know, who gets it? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. So ALS is a neurodegenerative disease, and it's a neurodegenerative disease that primarily affects the motor system. 
So what happens is people develop weakness that's progressive over time. The weakness can affect the arms, the legs, the talking, chewing, swallowing muscles, and the breathing muscles. And as I've said, it's neurodegenerative. We don't currently have a cure for it, and so it's inexorably progressive. Okay, so let's stop here for a second. Neurodegenerative, just explain what the problem is. What is the underlying defect that causes this dysfunction in those motor neurons? It's a great question, and one that I don't think we have a clear answer to. And in fact, I'm going to reframe the question. I don't think there's a single defect. I think there are different defects. So the way I think about ALS is not as a single disease entity, but as a clinical syndrome that has many different causes. The analogy is people who have anemia, low blood count, can be because you're iron deficient or B12 deficient, but you still have anemia. Okay. And that's got important implications for how we approach this therapeutically, because different treatments for different people based on what we think the underlying problem is. And I think we'll come back to that, but it's a very important thing to say that although in many people we don't know the cause, we do know that there are many different causes. Okay, so there are different pathways to get almost at the same clinical manifestation. That's right. Great. So is there a cure for it? There is not. Yeah. And you said the symptoms, you know, the way it's manifests itself, it's, it's how? It's progressive weakness. Progressive. Difficulty moving an arm, difficulty moving a leg that leads eventually to paralysis, difficulty speaking, difficulty chewing, difficulty swallowing, and difficulty breathing. And it's the breathing that ultimately gets people, right? If we've got weak legs, you can get around in a wheelchair. If you have a weak arm, somebody can help you. But if you can't breathe, that's ultimately what's usually why this disease is fatal. And right now, there's the cure for it. Correct. And so what do we do in that case? If, so if I, you're asking me from a research or a clinical perspective? Well, or both. Both, yeah. So let's start with the clinical perspective. Yeah. So the way we look after the people with this disease is through what we call multidisciplinary care. And I should explain what that means, but I think it means different things to different people. So this disease affects people in a myriad of ways, and no single healthcare provider has all of the expertise to look after somebody. So we bring a patient with ALS to the clinic, and it's very patient-centric. We have a team of people who move around the patient from neurologist to nurse, to physical therapist, to occupational therapist, to speech therapist, to nutrition, to psychologist, to social work, to respiratory therapist. All of those people come to a single clinic and see a patient at that visit so that any patient with this disease gets holistic and comprehensive multidisciplinary care. And that's the bedrock of how we look after people. And we know that that prolongs survival and improves quality of life. Then what we add to that, which are key, on nutritional support, because people with this disease lose weight and you need calories to fight the disease. We can talk separately about that. And also judicious use of non-invasive ventilation to support breathing. And then we have some drugs, some pharmacological therapy that are really at the moment for the most part modest, but for one of the genetic forms of the disease, now maybe a more powerful therapy has emerged. So you find this in what you're saying, in essence, this is a progressive disorder, neurodegenerative disease, um, that is best treated through supportive care, Correct. by and large. Uh, we don't really have an intervention that could um, reverse the course once it, um, it has begun, uh, which really takes me now to your seminal discovery that there may be a subtype of uh, patients that if you can begin to focus on the preclinical symptoms or early detection that this disease is about to begin, you can perhaps intervene. Is that the significance of some of the work that you've done, some of the paradigm shifting work that you've done? Yeah, let me try to sort of explain that a little. So part of what got me interested in studying this disease, apart from being a neurologist who looks after people with the disease, is the concern that we bring treatments to bear too late in the course of disease. So to explain that, people with symptoms, the symptoms aren't usually immediately apparent what they mean. And the latency, the time, the delay from symptom onset to diagnosis in the US is about a year. And it's even longer before people get into an experimental trial to try out a new drug. 
The equivalent in cancer would be trying to treat all cancer that is metastatic. And we know that therapies are more likely to be effective when we intervene early. And so that's the paradigm shift, is to say, how do we think about earlier therapeutic intervention? And that's not just shortening the diagnostic delay, but it's also recognizing that the disease process begins before symptoms become apparent. Another analogy, it's like an incubation period. You've got a COVID infection, but you don't have symptoms yet. You've been infected. The virus is there. It's replicating. You could be spreading it, but no symptoms. And the same is true in ALS and in other neurodegenerative diseases. And so our insight was to push the field in that direction, to find ways through people who are genetically at risk to study that population, to find markers that tell us who amongst those people are going to develop disease and when, and then what's the opportunity for early therapeutic intervention, perhaps even pre-symptomatic intervention that might be preventative. And it's that old saying, right, prevention's better than a cure. The earlier we can get in, as hard as that is, I think the more likely our treatments are to be effective. Good. And in, in, in let's dissect that a little bit more. If early intervention is going to be the piece de résistance, uh, so to speak, in order to be able to alter the course of the disease, then we must also understand what the underlying defect may be. I know you alluded to multiple causes. Now, uh, tell us what some of those possibilities are. Is it an accumulation of uh, abnormal protein in the neurons that end up uh, causing um, neuro neuronal death? Uh, is it a problem with the, uh, with the synapses, uh, a problem with um, too much glutamate or not enough of it? But, so please, uh, break it down for us at a mechanistic level so you can at least begin to get a flavor of what the problem may be and what the interventions would be. Also, what kind of early markers you know, we can detect to tell us that, hey, this disease is beginning uh, to, to, take, to, to develop? Yes, these are million-dollar questions. Let's start with sort of what we know about cause, and then we can talk about biological pathways. So from a cause perspective, our greatest insights come from the genetic realm. Um, and I should clarify a little bit of terminology here. We typically think of ALS as being what we call familial and sporadic. Now, familial literally just means there's a family history. Sporadic means there's no family history. There's nobody else in the family who has the disease. Which is more common? Sporadic is more common. That's about 90% of disease and familial is 10%. And the old thinking, and I want to emphasize that it's old, is to think of sporadic as non-genetic and familial as genetic. But it turns out that about 15%, at least, of patients with ALS have a single gene that causes the disease, and we find all the same genes in people with the family history and without. So we get a genetic cause of disease, even when there isn't a family history, and if we want, we can talk about why that might be. But what we know is that in 15% of people, we can find a single gene that causes disease, and that's about 20 or 30 different genes. That's part of the challenge. But overall, we think the genetic contribution to disease probably explains about 60% of the risk of disease. So a lot is genetic, but there are almost certainly other factors, and those are going to be a combination of age, the aging nervous system, but also environmental exposures, and we know much less about those, and then the potential for interaction between all of those. Then you ask about biology and pathways, and those genes and other mechanistic studies lead us down a number of different pathways. But I'd say one of the most important is the idea that proteins misfold in the cell and cause problems. And the easy way to think about that is imagine you're filing pieces of paper in the file cabinet. It's easy when they're straight and they've just come out of the printer, right? They all file neatly. But if you crumple them all up, they're misfolded. And now you try to file them, that filing system is going to be a mess, right? And that's at the core, I think, one of the problems that's going on in this disease and in fact many other neurodegenerative diseases. And so how do we fix that problem? How, how do you clean that mess? How do we clean that mess? And what tools do we have? Or, or, or are we just going to say, yes, there is a mess there? Well, I think, again, if we can get upstream. So if we can target the underlying genetic cause, again, prevention, before there's yeah, a mess, nice. right? Let's you know recycle, keep the kitchen clean. Let's not wait till the garbage piles up and then say, what do we do now? Fascinating. So... 
now you have really piqued my interest. Uh, now there are many genes that are associated with ALS, uh, but you seem to, but you say there is one dominant one that seems to be present, but some people have the disease, um, but others do not. And it has to do with the exposomes, what the, the environmental yeah. factors that individuals are exposed to that may lead to the development of the disease. Is that a fair summary of yeah i might pull us back a little bit from that because the exposome is a complicated idea we don't know that much about it so i'll pull us back a little so the most common single genetic cause of disease is a, a, what's called a repeat expansion disease in a gene called c9orf72 the name right. doesn't matter so much but it alone accounts for i don't know six to seven percent of all als that's a relatively recent discovery only discovered a little over 10 years ago one of the other common genes, though not nearly as common as that, is the SOD1 gene. And that was discovered back in 93. And although that only accounts for 2% of all ALS, it's genetically simpler than c 9 orf 72 We understand the biology better. And because as a community we've been at it for much longer, we now have tractable therapies that we think have a meaningful effect in people with disease that make them attractive um, approaches for us to potentially use as preventative options. This, uh, this is great. So focusing on the potential early intervention, is, this, is there an opportunity for us uh, to use a, a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene editing therapy to maybe address the defect uh, in people bearing that gene, even though we don't know who's going to develop it. So I think it depends on the gene, and I'm not the CRISPR guru, and it's not yet in the clinic, at least for neurological disorders. But for genetic mutations like in the SOD1 gene, one strategy that has proven to be viable is what's called an antisense oligonucleotide, or an ASO. And so we can give these intrathecally into the spinal fluid. They lower the total level of SOD1 protein. If you remember, we said that it's the misfolding of proteins that are the trouble. So if we can lower the level, not just of the wild type, but also the abnormal protein, can we then reduce that toxic effect in neurons? And it seems that the answer is yes. Excellent, excellent. Um, one of your seminal discoveries was the discovery of uh, neurofilaments that are released in the blood and that could be used as a marker um, of uh, early disease. So tell us a little bit about that and, and the significance of this discovery. I'll tell you why it's important, at least from a preventative perspective, because it's got many implications and we may not have time to talk about them all. If somebody carries a mutation in the SOD1 gene, they have a very high lifetime risk of developing disease. But we don't know how to predict when they're going to develop disease. Is it when they're 20, when they're 50, or when they're 70? So imagine we're wanting to treat people pre-symptomatically, and we're wanting to show that the drug works in a clinical trial. I can't treat everybody and wait 50 years to see if the drug works, right? We want to treat those people in whom the disease is coming sometime soon. So one of the key observations from one of our observational and natural history studies of people at genetic risk was that we found that levels of neurofilament in the blood, not only the spinal fluid, but in the blood, because it's easy to monitor, go up 6 to 12 months before people develop any symptoms or signs of disease. Why look at neurofilaments? What, 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 what triggered that age? Great question. Neurofilaments are a major structural component of axons, of nerve cells. And so the thinking is that if nerve cells are dying, neurofilament's going to be released. Can we measure it? And can we measure it reliably? And so the beauty that... In the, is in the simplicity of finding this in blood. When we're doing a clinical trial now, people get their neurofilament monitored every month. We have to send a phlebotomist out to their home, the blood is drawn, it's shipped to the lab, we measure neurofilament, super easy for people, and we can monitor them, we can surveil and say, look, your neurofilament's gone up, there's no other explanation for it, disease may be coming soon, let's intervene now rather than wait. So now you have a great tool, a great marker that you can use in your clinical trials to, see, mark, to look at the effectiveness of any intervention? Maybe not any, but well, certainly the ones that we're currently looking at. And there are some caveats, we won't get into them, around which populations these markers apply to. But in the SOD1 population, at least those with the more aggressive, rapidly progressive forms of the disease, this looks like an excellent marker and one that we've put into a clinical trial um, in partnership with the pharmaceutical company to test these hypotheses. Is there a difference in neurofilament levels, um, a different stage of disease 
for the sporadic versus the genetic causes. It's in- Although, you know, we, we, I, I'm bastardizing you because you already said no, it's okay. genes are, there's so many genes involved. Yeah, but it, it's okay. So the way we, I think about neurofilament is it's like the speedometer on the car. You put your foot down, how fast are you traveling? Neurofilament is a measure of speed with which motor nerves or neurons are dying. So it doesn't actually change once people have disease. It sort of sets a threshold. It's like cruise control. And we measure and we say you're going fast or you're going slow. And there's a range in between. And so it's a useful tool in that regard when patients come to clinic, um, although it's only just beginning to get into clinical use, where we can use that as an additional tool to tell us what the future might hold. Fantastic, fantastic. So, um, since this landmark discovery, um, how uh, how many? Well, well, first of all, are there some limitations to using this technique to monitor the effectiveness of of the intervention? In, in, in uh, what are you discovering in your clinical trial? Yeah, so I think a few things I would highlight. The one is, as we've said, because this is a marker of the speed with which neurons are dying. This is the best marker pre-symptomatically in people with aggressive forms of the disease. And we should say this is very varied. Some people, the disease can progress much more slowly. And in those people, I think neurofilament is not going to be a great marker, at least not on its own. We may need other markers that we can combine and to make it more helpful. But once people have developed disease, we've spoken about the prognostic value. It tells us something about the future course of disease. If it's high, more aggressive. If it's low, not as aggressive. But maybe even more importantly is that if we can lower neurofilament in response to a treatment, that's a very good sign that we're doing something. The analogy there to make this helpful to the listener is if you've got a high cholesterol and we want to treat it, we don't have to wait to see if you have a heart attack or stroke to see if we're being effective. We can measure your cholesterol. It's a biomarker. And we can see it goes down. We say the drug is working. So can we do the same in ALS? When neurofilament's high, and we give you an experimental treatment, if neurofilament comes down, that's a good sign that that's a drug. If you were a betting person, you'd want to bet on and put into phase three and say, that's a drug worth trying. So I think this becomes a tool for drug development to help us triage what, what's worth pursuing and what's not. And a very powerful tool. A very powerful tool. Tell us about the ATLAS trial and, and how this relates to yeah. neurofilament. So the ATLAS trial is a trial that we're doing um, um, in partnership with Biogen. Um, we went to them when we made this neurofilament discovery because they'd been developing an ASO, an antisense oligonucleotide for SOD1. And we said, look, given the efficacy and the safety data in the affected population, let's try this in the presymptomatic population. So what we do in ATLAS is we find people who carry an SOD1 variant mutation, um, a subset of people who we think will have aggressive disease, and we follow them over time monthly with their neurofilament levels in the hope. When neurofilament goes up, if there's still no sign of disease, they get randomized to drug, the ASO, or placebo, and we follow them until they do or don't develop. And the ASO is an Exactly. When they develop disease, Mm -hmm. then they go on to open-label drug. So that's important. The latest anybody gets active drug is at the point of what we call phenoconversion, when clinically manifest ALS becomes apparent. And so, but we also have the opportunity pre to do the placebo comparison. And so what we're hoping that we will learn in this study, but that will be relevant to all therapy development for ALS, is that we're going to get a look at what treatment looks like pre when neurofilament goes up, what it looks like at the point of developing clinical disease, And through the existing clinical development program, what does it look like when you give the drug, the ASO, already into disease that's well-established? So coming back to this idea of how important is early treatment. If I'm going to predict, I'm going to say the people who get treatment late will have some benefit, but not great. Those who treated at manifest disease will get more benefit. And maybe, this is the hope, those treated just when neurofilament goes up, maybe we can prevent it. And think about that as a paradigm shift for what the impetus and the imperative becomes for what we need to do for all forms of not just ALS, but other neurodegenerative diseases as well. That's what I'm going to say. So you think this this approach will have significant applications? I think that's right. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. So so in the remaining few minutes, um, one of the observations that I've made from a distance is that it seems that 
patients who suffer from neurodegenerative diseases in general, in particular ALS, have a willingness uh, to participate in clinical trials. And, and tell us a little bit about that and, and, and why, this, um, why, why this predisposition uh, to engage in studies, whereas this is, this may not be true for many other forms of cancer? It's a, it's a great question. I think there's something unique, if not unique, certainly special about this community. Maybe in part it's driven by the fact that this is a disease that has proven so stubborn to developing effective therapies and for which we really lack a meaningful cure. And so that's a powerful motivation in its own. I think certainly in the genetic population where people have seen a parent die with the disease, a sibling die with the disease, sometimes a child die with the disease, that's a very powerful motivator. And what we hear from a lot of people who participate in our pre-symptomatic studies is they're doing it not just for themselves, but for their family members. And we've long believed, and this is sort of it's part of our core operating principle, is that we believe everything we do in this space is on behalf of this patient community. This is a partnership. It's a collaboration. There's a great expression in our community, our patients say nothing about us without us, right? And so this is a partnership. We need and want our studies to be informed by patient need. We want our patient perspective on what we're doing. We want to design studies in a way that lower barriers to patient participation in research. And in, in, in that vein, tell us about the ALS Center that you run here, which is, a, I believe, one of the, what, the second largest one in, in, in the country, if not the world. I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, yeah. but, but tell us a little bit about so the ALS Center. certainly the largest clinical program in the state. Mm -hmm. I would say we're a, a medium to large clinic in the country. There are other large clinics. We're one of the, the heavy-hitting ALS research programs, and one of the things we do well, very well, is combine the clinical work and, and the research work. Um, but the center here, in addition to the research that we've been talking about, we run a clinic where we look after patients with the disease. And I told you earlier about the multidisciplinary approach where patients see all of these providers. One of the unusual things that we do that I think now others are following suit is we also put a research person into that multidisciplinary team. So every patient gets to talk about research, not just the research that we're doing here, but research opportunities everywhere. My mindset is that until we have a cure for all of this disease, every patient should know what the research opportunities are, what those are in terms of what might help them, but also how they might help us, if not for them, for their family members, for the next generation. And there's an incredible altruism in this community of a willingness to participate and I think we have to harness that willingness, that um, um, altruism, but we also have a burden of responsibility to make it easy. So what we try to do is think about how do we lower those barriers? What are the opportunities for assessments in the home, for remote assessments? Why bring a patient here if we can do phlebotomy at home? If we can do an assessment by video, let's do it by video. Let's bring patients here when they have to come on site for, I don't know, a spinal tap, because we can't do that in the home. So we look for the opportunities to make it as easy as possible to lower those barriers. Um, we have protocols. We use the electronic health record to gather data. There's no reason why every patient can't sign up for that. And that's part of why most of our patients, overwhelming majority, participate in studies, which I think is very different to what goes on nationwide. I, I know you are understated and you would admit it, but, but we also have to credit your sensitivity, your humanism, in your approach and your style of uh, engaging with this patients while you have uh, nearly 100% participation uh, in the research and trials that are ongoing. I think that's the core of our humanity, right? You, you, you don't go into this field and looking after people with this awful disease without a real sense of compassion. And I have to tell you, it's humbling to look after this patient population. Um, I don't know how people live, you know, face down and live with this disease and bring the equanimity and the altruism that they do. Um, that, I think, for me and for all of my team, and I have to give credit to the many people in the clinic on the research side, we have attracted, we've grown, we've cultivated, we've built a group of people um, who bring that compassion, bring that humanity, who are inspired by our patient population to provide care and to do the work that we do. Yeah, well, well, clearly, you're, uh, you, you exude passion, compassion, in addition to competence. So we are fortunate to have you here. So in, in the closing moments here, tell us a little bit about wh what you see for the future and anything else that you would like to add uh, for the audience. 
Yeah, so it's great. What do I think the future holds? Um, I think we are making real progress in understanding the disease. It's never as fast as we would like. We need to be sensitive to that. Um, our ALS patients live on a different time scale to the pace at which science often proceeds. So we need to do everything we can to accelerate the pace. I think therapies have begun to come and will come, I'm hoping, in quick succession initially for the genetic forms of disease. And I say that because when you understand the cause, it's much easier to target, it's more tractable. Where we don't know the cause, that's much harder. I think we have a lot of work to do to understand the biology, and we haven't had a chance to talk too much about biomarkers. Neurofilament is one of them. But we need tools, other tools like neurofilament as biomarkers that can accelerate the pace of discovery of therapeutics and triaging what's useless. Let's stop thinking and talking about it and focus our attention on the things that are promising. So we are making progress. I think hope is on the horizon. And that's another thing to come back to what you were saying. There's hope in participating in research for our patients. I never want it to be false hope, but there's real hope in the progress that we're making. Um, and we're always here to walk with our patients in trying to drive this research agenda forward. And hopefully very soon we have much more meaningful therapies. Dr. Benantaran, thank you so much for your incredible work. Thank you for pioneering research that brings hope to a population that is in desperate need of some intervention that will make a difference. Uh, your work inspires us. Your humanism is um, unparalleled. So thank well, I you. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge, compassion, passion with our audience today. And this has been another episode of Inside Your Miami Medicine, where we were entertained by the incredible Dr. Michael Benatar, the chief of the Neuromuscular Division and the executive director of the ALS Center at the University of Miami Middle School of Medicine. Thank you, Dr. Benatar. Thank you.